Good morning. My name is Bill Bully, and I'm just delighted that you're uh, here this morning. Aren't you glad that uh, God tapped you on the shoulder and woke you up this morning and said, why don't you come on over to my house? Yes? It's a, yes. It's a glorious morning. And not only that, but it's a new season. You know that, don't you? And we're all feeling it here in Minnesota. And it's lush, and it's green out, and you're working in your gardens. You're working on your golf game. Life is good. Kids are getting out of school this week. <laughs> we'll pray for you. We'll pray for everybody, okay? It's going to be a good summer. And we're glad that you're here at, at uh, Hosanna this morning. We're having a, a good morning. Uh, I got a couple things that I want to talk to you about. But while I do, I'm going to invite the ushers to come into the room and wait upon us to receive our offerings and our gifts this morning. I, th- I don't know why. I was thinking about the ushers this morning. In this context, we were out to eat last night and we had a young woman named Nikki taking care of us, waited on us, did a great job. And uh, I, I was thinking, that's what they do, isn't it? They wait upon us, give us a bulletin, help us get our seats. A little later, they're going to serve us communion. And so I just want you to, uh, if you get a chance when you leave today, say thanks to the ushers for their service. Don't need to tip them, okay? Don't do that, but just say thanks for the way they serve God. And in these next few moments now, we're continuing our worship in a way. It's not like we get the offering out of the way with our gifts We're saying thanks to God because he's the first giver. Yes, so thank you for your generosity. We have guests in the house, people who are here for the first time. And if I could make eye contact with you wherever you are, I would say to you we were expecting you in a way we prayed for you already. And what we prayed is that uh, you would have a sense of peace and joy and even, uh, you know, welcome here this morning. We're glad you're here. The Lord led you here. And if we can connect with you and have a conversation with you or answer any questions, we have guest services stations on your way out. Stop by and chat with those people, okay? There's a parents' room that way, should you have need, and there's a prayer chapel that way. And it's available to you now, all morning long, people who would love to pray with you and uh, just connect with you, lift your concerns and your thoughts up to the Lord. Um, Last lift invitation I just think as a whole group we should say that three times okay say after me last lift three times out loud everybody in the house ready one two three last lift last lift last lift I'm going to tell them at the conference tonight that we were speaking in tongues this morning okay that's the, that's why I wanted you to do that you just saw that you know the business on the lift conference uh, in the video it's in your bulletin I you know just one last personal invitation if you care to come tonight at seven o'clock it'd be wonderful we got about 250 300 people coming to the conference starts tonight but what we love is when a lot of Hosanna people come and and surround them kind of like we're experiencing this morning and they hear our voices and and we worship with them which is what we're going to do tonight and then our speaker is Gabe Lyons, and he's a, uh, a distinctive, important young voice in Christian America right now. I think you want to hear him. Uh, gaining notoriety. He was on CNN the other night talking about, uh, you know, why didn't the world end a couple weeks ago? He, he had a comment on that. Good guy. Come tonight if you can. Now, we have a guest speaker this morning as well. His name is David Householder. David Householder and I have been hanging out together for uh, over 17 years. He was our teaching pastor for eight years here at Hosanna. A lot of you are here. And you knew then or since then you've come to know that nobody teaches Bible like David Householder. And so I'm always just delighted to welcome him back. This morning he's going to get us into the book of Galatians and give us some insights and some thoughts as to what Paul was dealing with in that letter to the church in Galatia, okay? One other thing I want you to know about David, not necessarily a new title for him, but one I would lift up this morning is he is an author and his latest book looks exactly like this. It's called The Blackberry Bush. It's a novel. It's a great read. It's based on the book of Galatians, as a matter of fact. Two, two um, noteworthy characters in the book, Josh and Kati. And what you read about in Josh and Kati is that they're dealing with some of the same issues that Paul was writing about in the letter to the Galatians. It's a great read. Immediately after the service, Dave's going to slip out uh, over to the Daily Bread books. If you care to, come and see him, get a book, he'll sign it for you, and you'll be blessed by that, Okay. Meanwhile, David's here to teach on Galatians. Would you just clap like mad as David Householder comes up here, please?
How cool is that to have a jazz pianist while you're doing the announcements? I, I, I would like to have a jazz pianist behind me wherever I'm talking, like, you know, just at Target, wherever. Well, I'm Dave Householder, and I'm here to tell you that God is good. All the time. Why is that important? Because if we don't believe that, we read the Bible wrong. If you don't have that settled in your heart, the nature of God, that he's never out to get you, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, until we settle that in our heart, we're going to read the Bible wrong. We have to ground ourselves in the unmerited love of God, which the book of Galatians is all about. And we're going to look at Galatians and a whole bunch of other stuff in the New Testament too. And our title today, take your notes out if you would. And once again, as I always say, you don't have to take notes, but those who take notes will be first in the kingdom. And yes, I do see who is taking notes from up here. I'm going to find a Bible verse on that one of these days. There's got to be one. Raise up your hand if you need a Bible. We're going to talk about winning the unwinnable game of life. And I'm going to walk you through some stuff from the Apostle Paul and Martin Luther from 500 years ago, both of whom shared a unique insight on the human condition. The human condition which is shared by everybody, not just by Christians, not just by believers, by everyone on the planet. We, we are in a situation. We are in an unwinnable game. And if you haven't noticed that, you will. There's no way to get out of here alive and there's no way to bat a 1,000 in this life. In fact, I've never met anybody that bats 500, even trying their very hardest. Life is hard, and the older you get, the more you become aware of that. So how do we engage in this unwinnable game? I'd like you to turn to Acts 15, verse 10. I'm going to introduce what we're going to do in Galatians. Acts, Acts 15, verse 10. When Paul dealt with the Galatians, he was dealing with people who didn't want to be Jews, never were Jews, and weren't interested in anything Paul had to say. So he had to share his faith in a way that made sense to people who didn't get the whole God and Bible thing. And I've always believed that if the gospel is true, it has to be true in every frame of reference. No matter where you share it, it should work. And if it doesn't work wherever you share it, we're not sharing it right. And I'm convinced there's some things about the way we're sharing it that aren't right. Otherwise, more people would get it. The fact that one-third of the people in the world are connected with the Christian church bothers me. And I don't think that's God's fault. I think we share it in a way which is impossible for people to hear. And we have to take a page out of Paul who shared it with people who didn't care about the message. And he shared it in a way that helped them to care about the message because he identified with the universal human condition that we are all in this unwinnable game. And it starts with the concept of law, if you want to put that up on the screen, the impossible demands that we face. Acts 15.10. So why? Why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear. We can't win the law game. You can't meet all of the expectations. And I would like to broaden the sense of law from just the law in the Old Testament to all of the good expectations that are placed upon us. When you were first born and you first started to learn English or whatever language you were raised in, Someone said to you, don't touch the stove, which was followed by, don't cross the street without looking, which was followed by, stop smacking your sister. <laughs> the law collectively for the whole human race is a set of expectations, all of which are good. How many of you think it's important to tell kids those things? But the truth is, it starts to compound. You get to school, stay in line, boy, girl, boy, girl. Don't talk so much in the lunchroom. I spent a lot of time in the principal's office because I had trouble kind of discerning what the real rules were. <laughs> then your parents start saying, 
get good rates. How many of you think good rates is a good thing? It, it's a good thing. Get good rates. Make friends, which subtly says be popular. Be successful. How many of you think there's a lot of pressure in Dakota County for kids to be good athletes? How many of you think our kids chafe under that sometimes? How many of you have seen bad behavior on the part of parents at those games? There's pressure to, being a good athlete's good, all this stuff is good, but collectively it starts to compound. And then when you get older, it gets worse. Are you spending quality time with your wife? Would the wives please raise their hands if their husbands are not spending enough quality time? This is your chance in front of everyone. So. <laughs> Spend more time with your kids. Eat right. Avoid the drive through Eat fruits and vegetables. Folks, if there were no women around, men would get rid of vegetables. I'm, I'm sure of that. <laughs> we just do it for you. Exercise more. Don't weigh so much. Spend more time in the Word. How many of you felt a little bit guilty that you're not reading enough Bible at least once in your life? Pray more. Make sure you vote every time. 85% of Americans said they voted in the last election, according to a survey. We can only find half of them. <laughs> floss. If, just, just floss the teeth you want to keep, you know? All of these things are good. Folks, the law is good, but none of us can keep it. Honor your father and mother. How many of you think that's difficult as your parents get older? Yeah. Into the prune juice phase. It gets difficult. Real difficult. And we get into this situation where it starts to compound. I had to pay my quarterly taxes on time before I left here on this trip because, you know, you got to get that in on time. And you got to, how many of you are behind on your QuickBooks? All of that stuff. And we never finish on time and we never do it. And we always go to bed every night having not met expectations. And those expectations come from God, from our country, from the family, from everyone around us, from our boss at work. And it's impossible to meet it. Just a few hours ago at 2 a.m., I was sleeping very well. And all of a sudden, my eyes popped open, boom, because I thought about all the things I have to do for the next two weeks. How many of you had dread, task dread, <laughs> where you start thinking, how am I going to get all of this done? There's too much stuff, and all of it's good, and all these people are asking me to do good things, and I'm not going to get, yeah. And you start to escalate in the middle of the night. You ever do that? You start escalating, and by 3 o'clock, you're just, you know. We can't make it work. Next slide. We have impossible demands, and we respond with broken responses to those impossible demands. The way we cope with the fact that we can't keep the law, that we can't meet expectations, we can't meet God's expectations, we can't meet anyone's expectations, you will never meet your spouse's expectations fully, believe me, can't be done by a human being. It really can't. We respond with broken responses. And we start doing that very young, especially if you have siblings. Who broke this vase? My brother Mike, the perfect one. I'll tell you a little, little side about Mike. How many of you grew up in Bloomington? I am so depressed because they closed my high school. No homecoming, nothing. Lincoln, it's gone. It doesn't exist. So we exist as a school on this Facebook page, and we talk to each other, and we are all talk about how things were better back. We're starting to sound really old. <laughs> and I was talking to two guys I was friends with, and their big sister pops in and says, do you have an uncle in Des Moines? He looks just like you, but he's too old to be your brother, and he's too young to be your dad. It's my little brother. <laughs> From now on, he's Uncle Mike to me, but still. <laughs> Broken responses. Turn to Romans 7. Romans 7. Romans 7. 
verse 9. At one time I lived without understanding the law, the expectations. But when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came into my life, and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of these commands and deceived me, used the commands to kill me. But the law itself is holy. I want to say this really clearly. The law is good. And yet, ironically, it causes us to sin because we start to lie and cheat and deceive. And especially in Minnesota, as I go back and forth, put on a false front. This state is very good for that. Put on a together face, even when you're falling apart inside. Don't share what you're really going through. We project an image which isn't on the inside, which means we lose our integrity. And it happens in single-digit years. And we start to get better and better at it. And we start to lose touch with who we really are. And what we project and what we are becomes so split that we get alienated from ourselves. And we're not truthful with people or with each other. We get corrupt. Corruption is a part of everything we're a part of. The law is good, but it generates sin. Next slide, which leaves us caught in a blackberry bush. People say, why'd you call this book The Blackberry Bush? Well, it's about, as Bill said, Josh and Kati who grow up, and they get caught in a blackberry bush. And a blackberry bush is a symbol from a British legend that when Satan fell from heaven, he landed in a blackberry bush and he cursed it. And a blackberry bush is sort of dark and gnarly. And if you don't trim it back, it will compost your house. It's nature's barbed wire. It comes at you and it grows and it draws blood. And that's like the law coming at us and it traps us. And here's the ironic thing. Our attempts to keep the law make it worse. We compound the human condition through our broken responses, and the bush grows even faster. And we end up unable to free ourselves at all. I'd like to read one excerpt here from the book. This is, this is Kati as she starts to realize the human condition. And you did too when you were a young child. You started to realize that this is a game that was going to be really hard. To me, getting older just means harder jobs. My sister works harder than I do, and I know I'll have to be like her soon. She even makes dinner sometimes. Math problems get harder. Books lose their pictures and are more challenging to read. I learn so much better with Grandpa because there's no pressure with him. My parents fight about me when they think I'm asleep. How many of you listen to your parents talking when... My parents fight about me when they think I'm asleep. Papa was angry with Mama because she yelled at me about my school grades. Mama shot back with, she has to get good grades because she's not pretty. My whole body froze in bed when I heard that. I'm not really sure what grades have to do with being pretty, but it's very bad somehow. I think Papa would like, me to, be, Papa would like to be more like Grandpa, but he can't seem to make it happen. I think about America a lot. She's living in Germany. Maybe I could be a different person there. My sister Johanna is pretty. Even I can see that. It makes people, all kinds of people, happy to look at her. And they look at her longer than they mean to. I, on the other hand, make people nervous. Except for Grandpa, people don't like to look right at me. And everyone always wants me to do better than I am doing. They say it's because they want the best for me. But it doesn't feel good. The older I get, the further behind I am. I don't have enough friends. I haven't finished enough homework. My room is not clean enough. I wasn't polite enough to my parents' guests. And the hardest of all, people don't like me enough. It's really hard to get people to like you. Or maybe I'm especially easy to dislike. Internal monologues as we start to realize what we're going through. And the more sophisticated our attempts to win the game, the more sinful we become. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, 
founder of Lutheranism. Although I don't think there's many Lutheran churches he would go to. That was pretty funny, actually, come to think of it. <laughs> Luther decided he was going to win the game. And he figured the way to win the game is to become a monk. Because then you'll figure out the game. The monks are experts in the game, the law, the rules. Got to get up at this time, got to pray at this time, got to do, do all the stuff. And then he would confess his sins for hours a day. And he realized he was making it worse. Making it worse. And he said, if anyone could be saved by monkery, it was me. And he, got, he failed miserably. And he realized he had turned himself into a wretch by trying to win a game that you cannot win. You can't do it. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You've probably memorized that verse. We all get caught in the blackberry bush. We all get stuck in there. There is no way out. No one in all human history has won the game. You can't win the game. Next slide. Rescue and spiritual rebirth. Turn to Galatians 3.13, if you would. We're going to get into the heart of Galatians here. Paul, Martin Luther, the insight they had. This first phrase is good enough. Galatians 3.13. That Christ, Jesus, has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. The law is good, but it brings forth a curse because we can't win. Paul, on the way to Damascus, just like Martin Luther thought he would try to win the game, so he became a Pharisee. Well, not on the way to Damascus, he became a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. Because he wanted to win the game and be perfect. They have like hundreds of rules, and he was trying to follow all of them. He was a Roman citizen with all of the pressures that came with that. He had a very successful business with all the pressures that came with that. Some of you have unsuccessful businesses and are praying for a successful business, but you have no idea what you're asking for because there's pressures that come with success. And he had all of that. And on the way to Damascus, he, like Martin Luther, snapped. Snapped. He couldn't even see. He ran into the living Christ. You, can, you, know, you run into one part of God, you run into all of him. That's that whole Trinity thing. You run into Jesus, you run into the Father, the Holy Spirit, you run into the Spirit, you run into, you, know, you can't run into part of God. You run into the living Christ, you get all of God. So he runs into the living Christ who rescues him. Was he presented with the gospel? No, he was not. Did he say yes to a bunch of theological things? No, he did not. Did he get hammered by the presence of God and was he rescued? Yes, he was. And one thing I love about people in recovery is they get the fact that you can't fix yourself. People in recovery go to groups and they affirm over and over that we can't do this, we can't win the game. If, if they could just share, if that would become contagious with the whole world, I think the whole world would change. Wherever you're losing, and we all lose in certain areas bigger than others. Some of us get Fs in some areas. How, how many of you get an F in at least part of your life? I do. We all know where that ladder to hell is for all of us. And we need Jesus for that and for everything. There is no way out of the snare, the blackberry bush, the whatever you want to call it, without Jesus rescuing us. There just isn't. And we need to be able to just call out for help. Folks, getting saved is not reciting the correct theology. It's not saying yes to truths about God. Getting saved is saying, Jesus, I can't do this. I can't win the game. I need your rescue. Martin Luther found one verse in the Psalms. Here am I, save me. That's all you need. Here am I, save me. And his life changed. Left the monastery, thought, dang, I want to get married. So he did. Married a nun, emptied out the nunneries. <laughs> emptied out the monasteries. Went out and did stuff. And just lived boldly. Did he continue to make mistakes? Yeah, he did. But he didn't worry about it anymore. Because he knew that the Lord had saved him. 
Here am I. Save me. Go, if you would, to uh, Galatians 2.19. Galatians 2.19. Do you ever notice when you're really in trouble? Really in trouble. Like physical trouble. Or you're walking through the dark in the woods. What are the first two words that come out of your mouth? One is mom, even for a grown-up. Even if your mom's passed away. Oh, mom. Mom, help me out here. Mother. And the other one is Jesus. Don't, when you're in the dark, don't you just, doesn't the word just kind of bubble up? When you hear things and just, oh, Jesus, help me out here. Because we know that Jesus is the one to rescue us. Go to Galatians 2, verses 19 and 20. Verse, Galatians 2, 20 might just be, yeah, it's as good as it gets. For when I, tried, when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. Paul says, when I tried to win the game, I lost. I was under a curse. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That last verse was underlined by my grandmother in her Bible, and it was read at her funeral. Galatians 3.20, amazing verse. So, impossible demands, the law, broken responses, sin. We get caught in a trap. We need rescue. We need to be saved. And here's the kicker from the book of Galatians. We're finishing up here. Galatians 5.18, if you'll turn to that. And this is the insight, which will be hard for you to hear, but it's true. And most religions, including Christian religion, get it wrong. Here's the problem with Galatia. Paul showed up in Galatia, and there's nobody that wanted to be Christians. Certainly didn't want to be Jews, especially with the entry ritual having to do with a knife. It just wasn't attractive. The membership course here is so much more gentle. <laughs> so he said, well, let's just... Lay hands on people, let the Holy Spirit come, and see what happens. So like, bring out your sick people, let's pray over them. And we ask the Holy Spirit to come, he, he comes. And what happened to Paul on the way to Damascus happened to these people because they also were in the same trap. You can never see the Bible and you can still be under the curse of the law. We're all in that curse. And he freed them from it. Jesus showed up, and they formed communities around this. And then they thought... Well, now that we've got this booster shot, let's go back to the law and see if we can keep it better this time. And the whole book of Galatians was written to try to stop them from doing that. Don't go back. How many remember the movie Aliens, the first one, way back when? Or Alien, whatever, the first one. I was like 17. And she's got this monster you know, coming after her in the spaceship. And she finally locks it behind her, but she remembers the cat is back there. And she goes back for the cat. And the whole theater is saying, don't go back for the cat. The monster's in there. And Paul is saying, don't go back to the law. Don't, don't go back in there. You'll lose that fight. Don't go back to the law. Folks, Jesus didn't come to give you a booster shot to keep the law. Jesus came to give you a whole new orientation, if we'll put that slide up, a whole new way of thinking. You don't go back to the law and try harder. The law is just your guardian until you get filled with the Spirit and you receive Jesus, and then you move on to a new way of living, which is, and this is hard for people in America to, to hear, a life of dr direct guidance by the Holy Spirit. We don't walk with the law anymore. We walk in the, in the Spirit. But for that to happen, we have to believe that God talks. And most Americans don't believe in voices from God. In fact, they associate that with craziness. You're hearing voices. <laughs> Put that on your resume. I hear voices from God. You know, when you're signing up for a job. You know, I speak in tongues. That's another good one to put on your job interview thing. We have to cultivate spiritual ears to listen to the voice of God. Because, folks... He's got way more talk than you got to listen. He's broadcasting 24-7 at you. He's not playing little games. Well, I'm going to make them sweat to figure out what it is. 
Oh, God's just not letting me know because he wants me to trust him. God wants you to know right now what to do. God cares about what you do next. He doesn't, he's not, he doesn't toy with us like a cat with a mouse. He wants us to know his will. And for some of you, that's really, really hard because you've never really had a sense of God speaking. And he doesn't speak with an audible voice. Even in the Bible, he doesn't speak with an audible voice. Hardly ever. He's, his spirit speaks to the spirits of the prophets, and they write stuff down. Thus says the Lord. They pick it up spiritually. And for some of us, that's so difficult because our heads are so noisy. How many of you think we have too much noise in our heads here? I saw a great T-shirt a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago on Main Street in Huntington Beach. Does the noise in my head bother you? <laughs> and we haven't cultivated our spiritual sides. And we're going to have prayer ministers come up after communion. They're going to be right up here. And they're going to be here for those of you who've never heard the voice of the Father. If you've never heard Jesus, shepherd's voice. You've never sensed the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And they're going to pray for your ears to be opened and to listen. Because otherwise, you're going to have to go back to the law. Guess what? You're going to lose that game. And when you walk by the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit starts to come out. And you, start, you start loving people. You start, not just because it's a rule, but because... It's the way we should do it. It's what God's asking us to do. In fact, this sounds heretical, but it's not. Jesus wasn't sinless because he was sinless. He wasn't sinless because he was a compliance athlete. You ever thought about that, how he must have kept all these rules and just done everything perfect? He wasn't sinless because of that. In fact, he broke everyone's expectations, trampled all kinds of rules, the Sabbath, everything. You've heard it said unto you, but I say to you, you know, you even messed with Bible. Why was he sinless? Because he heard the voice of the Father and followed it. That's the path to holiness, not compliance with the law. Do you understand the fundamental difference? Jesus was totally sinless. I believe that because he listened to the voice. He says, I do what I see my Father doing and I say what I hear my Father saying. He was in touch with, he cultivated every morning for a long time Listening, cultivated listening to the voice of the Father. Galatians 5.18, my new favorite Bible verse. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Don't go back for the cat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for Paul and his work with the Galatians and Martin Luther who picked up on it. Luther's name even floats around in the name of this church because we affirm what he had to say. I want to pray first of all, Lord, for the people in this room that are desperate to hear from you. And there could be a thousand different things that block that. I pray that they would have the courage after communion to come forward and have their ears opened. I pray for those people who have gone back, to, gone back for the cat, Lord. They got a good dose of you and they thought, now I can keep the rules. And as Dr. Phil would say, how's it working for you now? We pray for freedom, Lord. I pray for everyone here to be set free from the trap of the human condition. Lord, I pray for Jesus to rescue them. I pray that they would receive communion and receive the presence of Jesus. I pray for everyone in this room, Lord, that you love up on them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Does it seem to you that uh, what Paul was writing about in Galatians and what David was just teaching about in a way really prepares us almost perfectly for Holy Communion? Because in this Holy Meal, this, uh, we receive this gift, we receive the rescuing hand, we receive the radical grace that God offers us through His Son, Jesus Christ, yes? 
In Galatians 5, verse 13, it says, You have been called to live in freedom. Hear the, hear the, uh, the verse, folks. You have been called to live in freedom. Let it lean on your mind, okay? Not just called here to receive forgiveness. Yes, that, through the Lord's body and blood. Yes, forgiveness. But more than that, freedom. Breakthrough. It's radical. It changes you. It's transformative. Makes you a different person. What we talk about in Celebrate Recovery is that uh, the Lord wants you free of your hurts, your hang-ups, and your hobbies, or your habits, so you can rise above that. And Paul experienced that. That's why he could write in, in 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Fully Paul, but feel, you know, just filled with Christ. The forgiveness and the freedom are yours through this holy meal. The Lord's Supper, we invite you to his table if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. We prepare ourselves by confessing who we are, confessing our brokenness, confessing our need. Our confession is like the hand up to God, say, I need you, Lord. And then in the meal, he reaches down and says, I got you. The confession will be on the screen in just a moment. Let's pray this together. We prepare our hearts to receive the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Out loud in one voice, we pray these words of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Dear friends, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And then he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body which has been broken, which is now given to you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. Would you join me, please, in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In just moments, the ushers will wait upon us. A basket of bread will come down your row. Please take a morsel of bread and hang on to it that we might eat together. And let's continue our worship by singing during the distribution. This is the body of Christ which has been broken for you. Please take and eat. After supper, our Lord took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this cup, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this to remember me. In moments, a tray will come down your row. The white is juice, the red is wine. Please take a little cup and hold it, and we'll drink together. This now is the blood of Christ, which was shed for you. Take and drink. The body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Peace be with you all. Amen. There are kids in the room who did not just now receive communion. We don't want to exclude them. They matter. They're important to us. And if those children would stand up so we can see you, you're short, I'm short. Let's make eye contact, okay? We love you, kids. We're glad that you're here on a Sunday morning, and, and we love it when we get a chance to pray for you. If you're near one of these kids, just touch them. Put a hand on them. Bless them. Lord, we thank you for the children. We pray that they receive some of the message today, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would sow it into their minds and hearts, that they matter to you, that they are loved. They don't have to prove themselves, Lord. They're precious in your sight right now as they are. Bless them, love them. We pray that it's a great summer for them and their households, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you all stand for a final blessing? 
David mentioned it. There will be prayer partners uh, across the front of the church in just a moment. They would love to pray with you. Otherwise, you're on your way to enjoy a great day. Folks, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit be on each and every one of you. Amen. Have a great week. See you tonight. Here we go.